Well, I want to welcome everybody that's here with us today, those of you that are online as well. We especially want to welcome, there's many of you that are here to celebrate baptisms today, and that's going to be an awesome time. So let's uh, go ahead and give Jesus a big hand, because as we just sang, his name is power and his name has healing, healing not just in this life, but for the life to come. And so that's so awesome. Can we also give our band just a, a big hand? You know, we're a little small church, but man, these guys are, are really, really good. So uh, we just appreciate them so much and leading us in worship every single week. And, you know, there's that, that line in that last song that we sang there that, you know, I, I, I speak Jesus for my family and I, I just can't help it. You know, every time I hear that, you know, just choking up because uh, all of us probably have some family members we know that don't yet have the, the hope and the, the joy and the salvation that we have in Jesus. And so, man, that's such a, such a prayer for our family. So again, can we just give our band just a, a huge hand here this morning? And, you know, we, we have such freedom here in this country to, to worship as we're doing here this morning, but a lot of people throughout the world don't have that. In fact, did you know that over 360 million people representing 76 different countries this morning, if they were to worship like we just were, they would be executed for it. That has increased 20 million just in the past year. Things like worshiping together, of, of having a Bible. You, you could get killed for owning a Bible. 360 million people in our world. You're going, Gilbert, I, I'm, I'm glad that we don't face that here in the United States. And you know what? You're right. We don't face that in the United States yet. Pew Research, they did a study, and what they found is that over the past decade, the, the hostility towards Christians has just continued to increase and increase and increase and increase. Now, we're not at the point of, of physical persecution in this country, but persecution is extremely high for Christians, and it continues just to rise. Things like lawsuits against Christians for their beliefs, fines against Christians for their beliefs, people losing their jobs because of their beliefs. All kinds of things are happening to make it harder and harder for us to stand up and say, I'm a part of Team Jesus. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but like as I, I just said, the, the lawsuits that have been happening, the people losing their jobs that are happening has just been increasing. In schools, it's gotten really bad. Do you know who Richard Dawkins is? He's a very famous uh, atheist. And he has said that anybody who homeschools their children, and by the way, if you don't know this, but most homeschoolers in America are Christians, he said anybody that is a homeschooler in America that is teaching the Bible to their kids should be reported to their local authorities for child abuse. Our, our students, as they go off to school, whether it's high schools or colleges, they're being labeled as being bigoted and as people that are hateful. Just in the past year, a college in Massachusetts and one in, in New York, Christian colleges, had their accreditation heavily questioned because of their biblical beliefs. In fact, if you've read the news, just this week in Washington State, a Christian school there in Washington State sued the attorney general because the attorney general was trying to get them to hire, force them to hire people that aren't living according to a biblical moral standard. It's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse in our society. And maybe you've been experiencing some of this. Maybe it's your work. Maybe in your school. Maybe in your neighborhood. Maybe even amongst your own family. There are people that mock you and ridicule you for your faith, and they're trying to make your life miserable just because you believe in Jesus and in God's Word. The question is, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to continue on in a society that, that is just increasingly making it harder and harder and harder for us to stand up for our beliefs? Thankfully for us, we're not the first ones that have to deal with this. So that's why today we're starting a brand new series. It's called Thriving in Exile. And it's going to be based off of 
the New Testament book of 1 Peter. In fact, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter here today. For those of you that are tuning in online, there's a button right there in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. It's called Talk Notes. If you push that, that's going to take you to all the scriptures we're going to look at today as well as the points I'll be making. For those of you here in the room, you can either physically turn in your Bible or if you pull out your phone or your uh, tablet, uh, you can go to our website, exponential.church, and you can access all the talk notes there as well. Now, as you continue to turn to, to 1 Peter, let me give you just a little bit of context. Now, take a wild guess, even if you've never been in church before, take a wild guess. Who do you think wrote the book of 1 Peter? Peter, very good. You're a very smart crowd. I'm glad you're here with us today. Those of you online, I'm not sure. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's, it's written by Peter. And what Peter's going to do is he's going to write a letter to various churches. So it isn't just to a person he's writing this letter to. It's not to one church that he's writing it to. He's writing it to various churches. Now, if you were to take a Sharpie on a map and just draw, like connect the dots between all these different churches, basically you would be outlining the modern day country of Turkey. Okay, so that's who Peter is writing to. And what was happening in their day and time is much the same thing that's happening to us. Not so much the physical persecution, but for them, they were experiencing intense being just ostracized for their faith. Now, in more modern day terms, we say they were being canceled. You heard that before? Yeah, people, they're canceling everybody anymore. Even the people that like used to cancel people now are being canceled. I mean, it's gotten, it's gotten ridiculous. But that's what's happening, is the people there in Turkey, they're trying to cancel the church, they're trying to cancel the Christians that live there. And so Peter is going to write to address this because he noticed that there was a couple disturbing trends in how they were trying to deal with this persecution that they were facing. And what they were doing is some of the exact same things I see Christians doing here in the U.S. The first thing is this, they said, you know what? If you're going to hate us, we're going to hate you. How many of you have seen some Christians you know, especially online, that you're like, should you be posting that? That seems like really mean. That, that seems like very hateful. You seen that before? Am I the only one that's seen it? <laughs> All right, thank you. This is the audience participation part. You know it's okay to talk back to the preacher, right? Seriously. If you want to say amen during a point, if you want to, you know, shout, hallelujah, whatever, it's okay to do that. All right? So when I say, you know, hey, have you experienced it? That's like where your arm like this. <laughs> you know, what are you, Pinocchio? You know, I got to like pull some strings or what? You know, come on. So how many of you experience this, that you've seen Christians that they're like being very, very hateful? Not hallelujah. That's the wrong part for that. <laughs> you know the old saying, be careful what you wish for, you know. So. <laughs> but what would Jesus have to say about this? Well, we know what Jesus has to say about this. Look at Matthew 5, 44. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so I want to say to you, don't you dare fight violence with violence. Don't you dare fight hate with hate. Don't you dare go on the social media and just start spouting off all of your opinions and stuff. It's just not helpful. It's not like helping the cause of Jesus. You know the greatest weapon you have against those that hate you? It's love. It's prayer. Show people that there's a way to interact that's different than everybody just screaming at each other. We don't talk to each other anymore, do we? We just talk at people. We've got to stop doing that. We've got to get to the place where we're loving people. We're praying for people. And they go, well, that's different. Because I'm saying some really mean things to you right now. I don't care. He's going to continue to love you and serve you and pray for you. And that changes people. Again, that's the greatest weapon that we have. Here's the second mistake that I see many Christians in America making, and that is relying too much on political parties in order to try to keep your morals and your values. Notice I used the word parties. Listen, Jesus is not a Republican. Jesus is not a Democrat. 
Sometimes the Republicans get things biblically right, and sometimes they get them horribly wrong. Sometimes the Democrats get things right from a biblical standpoint, and sometimes they get it horribly wrong. Thank you. We cannot rely on political parties to be like the the main thing that we're focusing on. Our job as followers of Jesus is to be on mission with him. And what is the mission that Jesus has given us? He's given us a mission to go out and help him to save the world. The world. And he has asked us to help him to make disciples of all nations. It's not about saving a nation. It's about saving the world, saving all people. Jesus loves all people. Jesus wants us to love all people, to serve all people, to pray for all people, not just the people that vote the way that we do. Don't rely on political parties. That's not what it's about. Jesus refused to take sides in the cultural wars of his day, not because he lacked an opinion, not because he lacked the conviction to say it. He did it simply because he knew that the moment you choose a political side, what you've done in that very moment is you've alienated, in our case in America, half the population. Our job is to help save all people, to pray for all people, to serve all people, not just half of the nation, the entire nation. So don't get off on your favorite political party or your favorite political candidate. It's about Jesus. He is the king. He is the king, and we are to serve him and serve him only. Because when you choose a political party, what you're doing is you're choosing a view over a you. Say that again. When you choose a political party, you're choosing a view over a you. And what's one of our core values here at Exponential? What, what's the what's t-shirt the that I'm going to wear out in the baptism in just a little bit? What's it going to say on it? You matter. Who matters? Just Republicans? Just Democrats? No, who matters? Everybody. You matter. Everybody matters. Now, I know you have a question then. Do you never take a stand then for biblical things? The answer is, yes, you sometimes do. You're going, well, when do you do that? And I'm going to say to you, you need to come back because I'm going to talk about that later in the series. (laughs) Today, what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at the first of four values we need to have if we're going to survive in a a, a world and in a nation that is increasingly becoming hostile towards us. All right, so let's jump in. 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll look at verse 1 and then the beginning part of verse 2. So Peter writes this, from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's people who are scattered like what? They're scattered like exiles in Pontus. Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father decided to choose you as his people. Now, a couple of observations here. The first one is this. Notice that he says that they are living as exiles. In their own nation, they're living as exiles. Basically, he's saying it's like you're a foreigner in your very own country. And again, any more That's sort of what it seems like here in America, that we're foreigners living in our very own country because people have gotten so far away from biblical Christianity. And so what what do you do about that? How do you thrive in an environment like that? In an environment where you feel oppressed and persecuted by your non-Christian neighbors or family members or friends? Peter reminds him here that, look, you belong where you're at. God has chosen you for such a time as this. And I want to say the exact same thing to you. 
that you are living in the neighborhood that you're in. You're in the workplace that you're in. You're in the family that you're in. You're in the school that you're in for a reason. God has you there for a reason. He has chosen you to be there. Why? To be His salt and His light to a lost and hurting world. To show people that there is a different way to live. That we don't have to be hateful. That we can love all people. Serve all people. Pray for all people. God has chosen you for the role that you're in. You are not there by accident. God has a plan for you, even in the toughest of situations. And His plan isn't for you just to survive. His plan is for you to thrive in exile. Now, I know some of you are going, Gilbert, I, I don't know. I, I, it's tough where I'm at. I don't know if I can stand strong in the midst of some of the persecution that I'm currently facing. Or some of you are, are thinking about, you know, hey, in the future, it may get worse where I'm at. I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand in that. Well, here's the good news for you. Little of you standing strong for Jesus has anything to do with you. Peter explains why. Look at the second part of verse 2. He says, God's Spirit makes you holy and sanctifies you for obedience to Jesus because you've been sprinkled with His blood. May His grace and peace be given to you in abundance. Now, I love this verse because, or the second part of this verse here, because we see all three parts of the Trinity here. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In fact, we could summarize the entire book of 1 Peter just in verse 2 here. Because what Peter is saying is this, God the Father has chosen you, Jesus the Son has come to save you, and the Holy Spirit of God wants to empower you. In fact, we could almost summarize the entire Bible with just that. That God has chosen you, the Son, Jesus, he wants to save you and forgive you. And the Holy Spirit is going to empower you for what it is that you need to do. Peter continues on then in verse 3. He says, Praise God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. God is so good. And by raising Jesus from death, He has given us new life. And a what? He's given us a, a living hope that lives on. Now here's what's interesting. I don't know if you've thought about this, but if there's such thing as a living hope, what does that mean there also has to be? A dead hope. You ever met somebody who has lost all hope? Again, this is the audience participation part. You ever, you ever met somebody like that? That they've given up? They, they've lost hope? It's interesting, over the last decade or two, medical doctors and psychologists now are seeing just how important hope is. That just as much as what they can do medically for people or mentally for people, that people that have hope do so much better. So uh, somebody that's diagnosed with cancer, if they have hope that, you know, I'm going to beat this, the likelihood of them beating it greatly increases. That doesn't mean that just because you have hope that, that it, it's going to happen for you, but it, it greatly increases your odds. Athletes that get injured, if they have hope that, you know what, this, this knee injury isn't the end of my career, I'm going to be able to make it back. Those athletes, they heal faster and they're more likely to make a comeback. Even things like students in school, they found that if a student has hope that they're going to be able to, to pass the test or pass the grade or, or get through a class that's tough, when they have hope for that, the average GPA is so much higher than the kids that just give up. And see, the same thing needs to, to be true for us. We need to have hope. And it's you know, not so much about the, the grit that we have or the skill that we have or how smart that we are. It's about hope. But here's the problem. So often we use the word hope as a verb. We say things like, I hope I get the job. I hope I find a girlfriend. I, I hope that I get invited to the party. I hope that I have enough money to pay the bills this month. In other words, I hope. I hope. You are the, the key central figure of your hope. But what if we changed hope from a verb to a noun? What if instead, instead of saying I hope, we said I have? hope. I have hope. You see, hope actually has a name. His name, we just sang about it, is Jesus. 
Our hope is found in Jesus. It's not I hope. It's I have hope because I have Jesus. God the Father has chosen me. The, the, the Son has saved me. The Spirit's going to empower me to conquer and do anything that He asked me to do. I have hope. Jesus said this about Himself. I will never ever leave you. And I'm never ever going to forsake you. And Jesus said, in this world you are going to have trouble. But He said, take heart. Have hope. For I have overcome the world. Again, Jesus, He is our hope. He is the one that's living inside of us. Our hope has nothing to do with what's happening in the news. Our hope has nothing to do with who's sitting in the Oval Office. Our hope comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. God has chosen us. The Son saves us. The Spirit empowers us. Verses 4 and 5, Peter then says this, And God has an inheritance for us, an inheritance that is, kept, that is kept in heaven for you that can never decay, be ruined, or disappear. They are for you who through faith are kept safe by God's power for the salvation which is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Jesus continues to do and will continue to do everything that you need to have done in your life. He is the hope that you need, no matter what it is that you faith. And so here's the big point that I want to make to you today. If you're taking notes, put it on your outline this way. My hope transforms opposition into opportunity. Again, so many Christians right now, we're, we, we see them out there and they're fighting against the world. They're fighting against everybody that's against us. And we're like, everybody opposes it. But it's not that you're being opposed. It's an opportunity to show the hope and the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus to other people. As followers, again, we don't just survive. We thrive even when bad things come our way. We rejoice when bad things come our way. You know, there's a great example of this. It's in Acts chapter 5. Peter himself, you know, the resurrection has happened. Jesus has returned back to heaven. The Holy Spirit has come. Pentecost has happened. And now Jesus has said, look, your mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. And so that's what the disciples and the early followers are doing. They're going out and they're, they're discipling people who are discipling people who are discipling people. And they're just talking about the name of Jesus to anybody and everybody that they can. But who wasn't happy? The religious leaders. They're not happy. And so they tell Peter, stop preaching about Jesus. What does Peter do? He keeps on preaching about Jesus. And they're like, stop preaching about Jesus. If not, we're going to arrest you and we're going to beat you. What does Peter do? He keeps on preaching Jesus. So what do they do? They arrest him and they beat him to a pulp. They flogged him with whips. We read this in Acts 5. They beat him. And what do they say to him once again? Stop preaching about Jesus. And then they let him go. Now, many of you probably think Peter probably left like this. All beaten and bloodied. His tail sort of between his legs. You know how Peter left? We know. Yes! They beat me because I'm preaching Jesus. They thought that I was significant enough in, in preaching his word and telling people how to become his disciple that they beat me for it. Yes! You know what happens after that? He returns back to his local church and guess what they decide to do? They throw a worship service. You know why? Not because he had been released from prison, but because they're like, God is on the move and we need to celebrate this. That they are taking notice of our little movement here. This ecclesia. Remember ecclesia. It's a movement of people with a common mission. We translate that word as church. The church is not a building. The church is people on a common mission. And so they're celebrating that, that the word is getting out so much that they feel threatened by us. And not in a bad way, because we're not threatening them. We're saying, join us. Join us. 
It wasn't about saving a nation. It was about saving people. It was about saving the world. Here's what you need to understand. Every single time throughout all of human history for the past 2,000 years, every single time the church is greatly persecuted, the church greatly grows. I actually heard a a missionary uh, from uh, China one time that said, I wish you American Christians would stop praying for the persecuted church in China. It's like, what? Why wouldn't you want us to pray for it? Because they were like, we don't want to become like you guys. Because you have a cultural Christianity where people just show up at the church on Sunday, they check the box that, okay, I went to church on Sunday, so I must be okay with Jesus. And then they walk out the door and live like hell. And this missionary was saying, we don't want that. The people in China that actually become followers of Jesus, we know they're really followers of Jesus because we can be arrested for our faith. We can be beaten for our faith. We can be greatly persecuted for our faith. And so we like persecution. The church is on the move. The church is on the rise. Again, every time for the past 2,000 years that we read about throughout you know, biblical history and then modern day history, when there's great persecution, the church grows and, and, and doesn't just, again, survive, but it actually thrives. And so you can beat us down as the church. You can beat us down as Christians, but we're always going to get back up. You can try to silence us, but we're going to continue to preach the word of God. You can try to cancel us, but we're going to keep coming back from the dead just like Jesus did. Why? Because we don't hope. We have hope. Verse 6. Peter writes, be glad about this. Talking about this persecution and suffering, he says, be glad about this. Even though it may be necessary for you to be sad for a little while because of the many kinds of trials that you suffer. Peter says, look, the the trials that you're facing today, they're really not all that big of a deal, especially in light of that you're going to spend a perfect eternity where there is no more sin, suffering, sickness, disease, death. That's what we have to look forward to. And so no matter what happens here on this planet or in our nation, it's only for a little while. It's only for a little while. And so rejoice in the sufferings. And remember that we have hope. We have hope. Verse 7. Peter says, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, I know there on the screens they had to switch because it was a a longer uh, set of verses there, but I'm going to have them actually uh, go back one slide there uh, for us because I want to point something out, uh, what's on the screen there. Fire is what purifies gold. The more pure you want the gold to be, the hotter the fire needs to be, the longer it needs to be in the fire. So if you want to go from 18 karat gold to 24 karat gold, you're going to make it hotter, you're going to put it in longer. Why? Because what it's doing is it's burning off all the impurities that are in the gold. And what Peter is saying to us is this, look, your faith is the exact same way. That These fiery trials that come your way, it's proving that your faith is genuine. Why? Because what it's doing is it's burning off any impurities in you. It's helping to to prove that, yes, I really do believe in Jesus. I mean, many of you here today, and those of you that are watching online, right now, intellectually, you would say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But if you start getting beaten and whipped and flogged, like what we were reading about here today, would you still do that or not? Or would you quickly go, I don't really believe in them so much. And so these fiery trials that we go through, they're they're purifying you. They're sanctifying you. They're they're making you holy so that you can be set apart for God. And then on the, the next slide then, Peter talks about something that at first seems very, very shocking. Look at it again. He says, why is all this happening? He says, so that who? So that you, you will receive what? Praise and glory and honor. You're going, whoa. I thought only Jesus gets the praise 
and the glory and the honor. I mean, this seems like blasphemy here that, that, that we are going to get praise and glory and honor. The answer is yes. Let me explain what I mean by that. Did you know that when you die, you're going to face two different judgments? The first judgment has to do with your salvation. Are you going to heaven or hell, essentially? Did you accept Jesus' offer of the forgiveness of your sins and for him to, to come into your life? So that, that's the first judgment. Where are you going to spend all of eternity? But what most people don't realize is that there's a second judgment that then everybody will face for those that are going to be destined to hell. And by the way, I want to throw this out because a lot of times people go, I don't believe in a God that would send anybody to hell. Well, I don't believe in that God either. If you end up in hell, it's because you chose to go to hell. Jesus, again, has given us a way out. God has chosen you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to empower you. But that's your choice. He's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. You have to choose Jesus for yourself. All right? So for those that don't choose Jesus, they reject Jesus all the days of their life. They will spend an eternity in a very real place called hell. And then there's a judgment for them. And that judgment will determine what the severity of punishment in hell is going to be for them. But then we as Christians, we're going to have a second judgment as well. And that's called the Bema Seat judgment. And what happens at this particular judgment is you are going to be judged for how well did you fulfill Jesus' mission. What is Jesus' mission for all of us? Make disciples who do what? Make disciples who do what? Make disciples. That's your mission here on this planet. Not getting a bigger house, not getting a fancier car, not getting your kids onto the right soccer team. None of that matters. You are here for one reason and one reason only. To make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And you're going to be judged on that. And that's going to determine the reward that you have in heaven. And also what will be determined in that is what did you do with what God gave you? How are you a steward of your time? Every single second of every single day of your life is going to be judged at the Bema Seat judgment. How did you do with the talents that God gave you? Did you use them all for yourself? Or did you use them to glorify Him, to continue His mission? Every single dollar that has ever, ever come into your possession, into your hands, it's going to be judged. What did you do with that money? Were you a faithful steward of God's resources or not? Every single word that comes out of your mouth is going to be judged there at that Bama seat judgment. It's pretty sobering, isn't it? Your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony, all judged. How did you do in fulfilling Jesus' mission? And those that do really good, they're going to get rewarded greatly. Big treasure. In fact, Scripture says a crown of gold. I mean, in light of everything that I've been talking about here, do you see now why Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal? He says, don't, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because moth and rust will destroy and thieves are going to break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And I want to challenge you to a treasure off. To a, a crown off. It's a competition. I want my crown to be bigger than your crown. And I hope you want your crown to be bigger than mine. You're going, well, that sounds really arrogant and cocky. Why would we make it into a competition? Well, here's the thing. I haven't explained it all to you yet. See, it's not about us. In Revelation chapter 4, we read that when that judgment comes and we're given our crown, we're given our reward, what we're going to do with that reward is we're going to get down and lay it at the feet of Jesus. because he is the only king that deserves a crown. And it's then 
that what Peter's talking about here is that all of heaven in, in that moment will give you the praise and the glory and the honor because they're like, that was a life that was well lived. That was a life that was worthy of a king who was willing to come and die for you. They gave everything to his mission. They gave every word. They gave every dollar. They gave every bit of their time. They gave every bit of their talent to the king of all kings. And we'll lay that reward at his feet. Verses 8 to 9. Peter writes, you have never seen Jesus. You don't see him now. But still you love him. Have faith in him. And no words can tell how glad and happy you are to be saved. And this is why you have faith. Just a couple minutes, we're going to be going outside and we're going to be baptizing a couple people who have made this decision to have faith in Jesus, to ask for not just his forgiveness of sin, not just that, that salvation part of judgment. But what each of these people are also doing is they're saying, you know what? I am giving everything to him. My time, my talent, my treasure, and my testimony. I want to be a part of Team Jesus. It's not just about salvation, but it's about service to the king. Verse 10. Peter writes, the salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. What he's saying is, look, the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, they all looked forward and they prophesied about what we have right now. They looked forward to the day that the Messiah would come and set things right. They looked forward to the day that all people could finally have hope. And what those prophets did is they passed on this belief, uh, sort of a baton, to the next generation, the next generation of look out for the Messiah because he is going to come. And ultimately, Jesus comes onto the scene and Jesus dies for our sins and Jesus empowers us. Again, God has chosen you, the Son, he's forgiven you. And the Spirit empowers you. So Jesus gives the Spirit. He passes the baton on then to his disciples who then go out and make disciples who go out then and they make disciples and they keep passing it on to the early church fathers. And the early church fathers, they faced intense persecution. You could be murdered for believing in Jesus, but yet they kept passing it on to the next generation and the next generation after that. And so they, they pass it on then into the, the Middle Ages. We're often then called the Dark Ages. Men and women who faithfully protected God's Word and continued to preach God's Word even though many, many people didn't want to hear it. And so they keep passing it on generation after generation, disciple after disciple. And ultimately, if it comes to the, the Reformers, people like Calvin and Luther and Wesley, and they pass on the baton then to the next generation and the next generation. They pass it on to missionaries who ultimately take it all over the world, and including new nations like ours. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is, is here in our country. And those missionaries spread it on to men and women, to bankers and, and to store clerks. They, they pass it on to, to pastors and to teachers. And throughout the generations in our country, it's continued to be passed down one generation to the next until it came to maybe it was your grandma or maybe it was your pastor. Maybe it was a neighbor, or a schoolmate of yours that they passed on faith to you. For me, it was two guys, Marvin and Keith. July 27th, 1993. They passed the baton on to me. And that night, it wasn't just about getting a get-out-of-hell-free card. It was about giving my life then to the king of all kings. My job as, as your pastor is to pass it on to you so that you'll then pass it on to others. The next generation needs you. And I'm not just talking literally like the millennials and, and Gen Z. I'm talking about the next generation of Christians. They need you to be who Jesus has called you to be. Not just somebody that's glad that I'm not going to hell, but somebody who is on mission for him. 
We've got to continue to pass it on because God has chosen you. Jesus has saved you and the Spirit has empowered you to fulfill this mission. Peter, in still talking about the prophets, says this in verse 11, the Spirit of Christ was in them and was telling them how Christ would suffer and would then be given great honor. And so they searched to find out exactly who Christ would be and when this would happen. Hebrews chapter 11, which is often called the Hall of Fame of Faith, talks about these prophets and other great men and women of faith, sort of legends of the faith. But then at the end of Hebrews 11, it says something very, very interesting. It says they were commended for their faith, but they didn't receive all that God had promised. See, you and I are different. We have received that. In fact, those prophets would probably be envious of what we have. That you have salvation, you have hope, Yeah, we have it. The question is, are we going to pass it on? I'll wrap up then. Peter says the, uh, again about them in, in verse 12. He says, they were told that their, messages, or that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Right now, angels are watching over you. And you know what they're doing? They're watching over to see, are you going to fulfill the mission or not? Are you going to be somebody that devotes your entire life to making disciples, to make disciples, to make disciples? You're going, well, I don't want to be a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor. Do it right in your neighborhood. Do it right in your workplace. Be the pastor of any place you walk into. Share the good news of Jesus with as many people as you can. Share how to grow in a relationship with Jesus with as many people as you can. We're not to hate people. We're not to save a nation. We're to save people. Why? Because people matter. People matter. Again, one of our core values here at Exponential, we need to every single day and in every single way show people you matter to God and you matter to me as well. So with your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony, Go out there. No matter what you face, no matter what persecution comes your way, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give in. Don't you dare quit or turn away. Because we don't hope, we have hope. His name is Jesus. So let's pass that hope on to as many people as we can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to begin this brand new series where we're going to look at how do we thrive as your followers in a, a nation that seems to be more and more against you. And so, Lord, we thank you for what Peter instructed us with here today, that you are the living hope that we need. And Lord, again, we thank you for those that are going to be baptized today, that they have accepted your hope into their lives. So I pray your blessing be on them. And I pray your blessing be on us as well. Not a blessing of of health, wealth, and prosperity, but a blessing of your Spirit empowering us more than the Spirit has ever empowered us to go out and do what it is that you called us to do. And Lord, I, I just pray that all of us would keep in mind not just this day, but the day. The day where we stand before you with that crown and we lay it at your feet. Again, it's not about this day. It's about that day. So help us to always live every single second, every single moment in light of that. That one day I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be rewarded based on what did I do with my time, my talent, my treasure, and my testimony. So Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would be found faithful that we'd be good stewards of everything you've entrusted us with so that we can make a difference, not just in this nation, but to do what you said, and that is to make disciples of all nations. Lord, use us in that way. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.